So anyway, I just wanted to say hello to everyone, to all the, the panelists who are here so far, and also to everyone who is watching as well. I'm Pamela Bush. I'm the founder of Wine Fair in the Vingard, and this is the fourth year we're doing Wine Fair. The first year we're doing it virtually. So thank you for your patience as we try to work through some of the technical stuff. Uh, uh, this panel, uh, um, Biowalk and Natural Wine, is you know, one that I've been talking to Nadia about for a bit, and other people in the industry too. And and um, you know, I think it's a, it's a it's a very important conversation to have, not just as a conversation in this one panel, but in other panels and other areas of the, of the industry too. Uh, but I think it's it's great that we have all of you here to discuss your, every, you know, all the wonderful things that you, you've done uh, as wine professionals. And thank you for being here and for your time. Uh, again, we're super lucky to have Nadia Pugh as, as our moderator today. Uh, Nad Nadia is someone who has another, has had another career, but over the last few years has been really getting into natural wine. Uh, I could be wrong, but it could be when you started you were interning or helping out at Donkey and Go. Uh, it, I'm sure you'll, you'll you could tell say more about that. But uh, has become a wine writer and uh, has a has a um, Nad Wines, which is her blog, and is always posting videos on Instagram with various natural winemakers in California. Uh, I will say this much about your IG account, Nadia. Like if I'm ever having a bad day or something, I can just go and see what you've said to say because you always have such like beautiful life affirming things that, that that you post it's just like it, it's it's a breath of fresh air um so i'm thank you very much for agreeing to do this panel i'm very excited about it i'm gonna jump off right now and then you know we'll, we're doing what we can to try to get both uh simone and um and mariah in so we'll, we'll be there in it you know but just keep you, you can get everything started now Okay, thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you for having me. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, we are working, if you're just joining us, we're working through some technical difficulties um, and trying to get Maria online. Um, but she has a beautiful picture uh, in the meantime. We also <laughs> have Simone uh, Mitchelson um, that is also part of this panel. So as long as we're just gonna keep rolling and as people um, uh, jump in, we'll just kind of fold them into the conversation. So welcome to um, the BiWalk Experiences in Natural Wine panel. Um, this is uh, almost the last panel uh, of today. Um, it looks like we just have a couple more. So welcome to Wine Fair if this is your first day tuning in. Um, but also, you know, I'd love to hear more about Wine Fair from all of you here. Um, I haven't been able to tune in all of the days. So I'm really excited that this communi community has come together for this experience. So I just like to thank Thank you to thank our sponsor, Owen Coulter Selections. Um, this is our sponsor for this segment. Um, panelists, um, I'm hearing that it's super sensitive um, if we're not, um, if you're not muted while you're not talking. So try to keep yourselves on mute if we're not talking. Um, but really, I just wanted to introduce uh, myself and then I'll introduce the panel and then we'll go from there and jump into the discussion. So when I spoke to Pamela first about this, um, doing a panel for Wine Fair, um, I wanted to come from a unique angle. Angle. I know that I have, you know, I can contribute to media conversations, um, contribute to, um, you know, inclusiveness, diversity in different ways. But I just felt like this was um, a very I don't know, a very special um, piece of the industry that I did want to highlight. You know, I believe in wine fair, I believe in the Vanguard and everything that it stands for in terms of social justice and, um, you know, um, really representing women in this space. But I think a, a pocket of this space that, um, you know, I want to highlight and make sure it doesn't get lumped into everybody else's experiences um, was just women of color in natural wine. I mean, in wine in general, but we're here for natural wine. So really my vision for this panel is to highlight the unique experiences of black, indigenous, and women, other women of color in the natural wine industry. 
Um, I plan to do so through questions that will draw out stories, both triumphs and challenges, um, about being a woman of color in this industry. I understand that not all experiences are the same, but also that not all are a struggle. Um, I, being a biracial woman of color, I have mixed feelings about the emergence of the term BIPOC last year because I felt like it lumped all of us together and I really didn't want that to happen. Um, but you know, a year, a year later, um, I reframed my thinking about this term and um, the, its acceptance in society within the past year. But I almost see like this, um, this acronym or this um, name and culture as something to show that we are not alone and that we have a sisterhood in our experiences. You know, all of them are unique. Um, we all have unique backgrounds, unique experiences, but we also want to make sure that, you know, we um, have each other as a community to lean on. Hi, Simon. Um, I see Simon has joined us um, and we're still working on Maria's video, but thank you all for joining. Um, so I will just do a quick round of introductions um, and then we'll jump into the conversation. So our first panelist is Akari Yamamura. Uh, she is a winemaker of Yamachan wine, uh, which whose first vintage was released in 2020. She has contributed to the production of other California wineries such as Purity, Donkey and Goat, and Vinca Minor. Akari's wine label folds her Japanese culture into her passion for winemaking. Hi Akari, thank you for being here. Our next panelist is Simon Mitchelson. Simon is South African born and Michigan raised. Her experience is in vineyard management and currently works for Jackson Family Wines as a South Coast vineyard manager and formerly has worked for Flowers Winery in Sonoma. She is also a co-founder of Natural Action Wine Club, a nonprofit wine club whose mission is to support BIPOC education and scholarships in winemaking and viticulture. She is based uh, in Central California. Our next, uh, our next panelist is Tara Gomez. Tara has worked in the wine industry for 24 years. Current projects include Keto Wines as the winemaker and Chemist to Dreams as the co-founder and co-winemaker. She is also a wine consultant for a few brands. She also serves as a member of the Woman-Owned Winery Advisory Council mentor for Speed Rack Advisory Squad, and a mentor for the James Bird Foundation uh, Legacy Network. Tara has been recognized for expertise in winemaking, recognition of the land, and proud of representation at the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians. Welcome. And last but not least, we have Maria Bailey. Maria has such a fun story, and we've had so many giggles over social media and virtually over the past year, getting to know each other as well. Um, recently, she left her corporate role in HR to pursue wine full time. She has worked in the hospitality industry for the past five to six years, and in 2020 worked harvest for PAX in California and for another winery in Vermont. Her emerging projects include wine retail with inclusive wine education and wine production. As a black woman, Maria is passionate about creating an inclusive environment for all to learn and enjoy natural wine. Thank you ladies for being here today. We are going to hop into the discussion. So my first question is when, and if applicable, who was your introduce, introduction to wine? And was it part of your culture growing up? I'm going to kick it to Maria to start off the conversation. Okay, well, thank you so much, Nadia. So sorry that no one can see all my weird facial expressions at the moment, but we're working on it. Uh, so <laughs> I would say my first uh, humble beginning in terms of wine was back in college uh, when I tried Apollo Bay as 2010 and I was just blown away. I'm like, holy cow, how in the world is there orange wine? And this was really before like natural wine in the U.S. really took off. Of course, that was like back in 2011 when I was finishing up college and I just wanted to know more. So I took it upon myself to 
to expose myself, self-taught myself while I was finishing up college, went to wine tastings, private, public, even held some with friends involving cheese and charcuterie. That way we could understand like more about wine pairings and prepared like family style dishes that paired really well, particular wines from all over the world. So, I mean, I was like mentally and emotionally like invested in it and I knew I needed to learn more. So I went down that whole path of going through uh, the Court of Master Sommeliers, which is now known as the Court of Sommeliers, and uh, obtained my um, sommelier uh, level of certification through them and just wanted to like dive in deeper, I would say, in terms of understanding more because I knew just being a SOM wasn't enough for me. I needed to be hands-on. And that's that's when like the whole wine production aspect really caught my eye because I'm one who's a visual and hands-on learner and I'm more of a scientific mind as well. So that all went hand in hand with it. In terms of me being raised around wine, I was not. My mom does not drink <laughs> uh, at all, even though right before I arrived to California, I actually was able to get her to like try some natural wines, which is shocking. So, uh, so that was great. But in terms of like the rest of my family, my dad was really an influence in my life. He was always someone who pushed me to, to expose myself to, to everything, even when I was growing up and was super supportive. He was like my go-to like wine buddy going to tastings if I didn't have anybody else. So, yeah. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't get myself off mute for a second. Tara. Oh, you're on mute, Tara. Okay, there it is. I was trying to get myself off of mute as well. <laughs> All right, can you hear me now? Yes, okay, great. So for me, I think it was my parents that kind of led me into winemaking when I think about it, because when I was growing up, uh, we used to go on a lot of um, wine tours, um, wine tastings. My parents used to go wine tasting a lot. And so back then, um, it was more allowed for like the kids to kind of tag along and go, um, you know, on the tours, walk the cellar um, as part of the tour. And so for me, it all started with a love of science. Um, and so that was my connection uh, was when I was going through one of the tours, I actually saw passed through the lab and I saw them doing titrations in their white lab coats. And so for me, it was an instant connection. So I knew in high school uh, that this was the direction I, I wanted to go. And so um, I started researching it and finding schools and um, and I stayed with it. Like, you know, how people kind of change a lot when you go through majors, but no, I stuck through it and, um, and I was determined, like I knew that this was my direction that uh, I wanted to go and, um, and it's still, I, I, I'm still so much in love with it. And, um, and it just feels like this is like gonna be my 25th harvest but every harvest to me feels like the first um, because when it's something you're so passionate about, um, it doesn't even feel like a job anymore. <laughs> so, so for me, I, I'd have to say it was my parents that um, through all the wine trips that we used to take when we were really young, um, that's how I started into the industry. That. We'll go to Akari. Um, so my wine journey really started kind of through food almost. So I was working after college at a fine dining restaurant and the sommelier there uh, happened to be a Japanese person. And so when we first started tasting wines, that lineup and things, um, I would pick up on really specific tasting notes that were like Japanese food. Um, and it was hard to explain that to other people who hadn't had things like pickled plums or whatever it was. Um, and But the thing that made me feel like I had to learn about wine was when we did a staff tasting uh, with food pairings. 
Um, and it wasn't the food pairing that was really good that made me think about this, but the bad food pairing where both the food and the wine tasted worse than um, they should have because of it was it was just the poor pairing choice. And I was like, whoa, I need to avoid this. And that was how I got into wine. Um, and I was introduced into natural wine pretty quickly after that because the wine shop I went to after that job was a natural wine shop. And um, since then, I've kind of gone through restaurants and retail, and I guess the last couple of years ended up in production. But yeah, um, I would say that my, my dad doesn't drink. Uh, my mom drinks a lot of beer, so uh, wine wasn't really through my family. Um, and I think we drank Charles Shaw in college, so. It wasn't really until like recently that I, um, or afterwards that I got into wine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I know all about the two buck, three buck Chuck and all the transitions through college. I think we all have unique stories in which, you know, um, wine comes into our lives and for some it's just like okay it floats past or it's just hanging out and for some of it's like oh no i need to know more and you take the deep dive and there's something that attaches on um and fuels that passion and it looks like we might have lost simon again i'm not i think we did simon you can speak if you happen to pop up but just let us know so my next question, um, and we're, you know, it, my questions are pulling from an array of different um, experiences. Um, so I want all my panelists to know to feel comfortable to speak to whatever experiences they feel comfortable sharing. So um, this question is, you know, in the past or present, do you find yourself conforming to an implicit or explicit standard within the wine industry? Um, if so, what are those standards? And you know those. Um, I know that that can be a really broad question, or it can be very specific. So definitely, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, um, we'd love to hear your experience. I'm going to go to Akari for first. Um, I guess because this is more natural wines. Um, I do feel like some part of the appeal for me with the natural wine community initially was that you didn't have to be like a rich white person to go to a tasting. Um, but I, um, I don't know. I, I guess it's a very like weird thing to think about. I'm not sure that I know how to articulate. Yeah, and you know, that's okay. I think as we, we can discuss um, among the group and if other thoughts pop up in your head, um, you know, let us know. I think um, we can go to uh, Maria and then we'll go to Tara. Great question. I'd have to piggyback off of Akari in the sense of that that is a pretty intricate question in the sense of how to approach natural wine from our perspective. And, and I feel like it's a little more relaxed. So I, I do agree. It's a little more relaxed in the natural wine world in comparison to where, where, our, where I started, I should say personally in conventional wine, working for retail wine shops earlier on. Uh, when I relocated to Ohio, I, I noticed there was a huge, huge spectrum. And a lot of the people, the shops I was working for were more, focus towards like the older generations, like baby boomers. So they they seemed, some of them, I wouldn't say all of them, some of them seemed very um, pompous at times where they, it seemed like they weren't really giving younger individuals, especially people of color, an opportunity to express and share the knowledge that they know, the skill set that they know, the fact that they have a great palate as well. And it's just a matter of giving us an opportunity to express that in a way that is high, that is respectable in that space that is, that is shared. So, or just being exposed to, you know, a, a different type of perspective that's involving 
something that that's not the norm that's breaking the rules a little bit and that's what i really enjoy about natural wine is there's really no rules it's still ever evolving unlike conventional wine there's i mean you got the scoring you got you got all of that whereas and that's how they rate quality wine which in some ways is kind of absurd and it's really prehistoric nowadays because who who is it to say that a uh, older white man should be the person that we should be following uh, in order to understand if a wine is legit or not. It's all based on everyone's palate. That's how it should be at the end of the day. And from my experiences, I've had it, I've had it where people have second guessed me that are older than me. And then once they really see me put my skill set to the test, they're just blown away and they're speechless. And on top of that, knowing I was the only person of color at these at these wine shops. I mean, I don't know if any of you have been to Ohio, but it's uh, <laughs> it's it's predominant. It's very skewed. It's it's predominantly white, and then you have like a very small population of black people who are not at all um, exposed to wine like the rest of us have been. And it's just a matter of that accessibility being welcomed, and that was what I was really pushing when I was there. But you got to have other people on board that are going to support you, especially if it's in, if it's involving natural wine and and transitioning to different different avenues and having people that are like minded like you who are also exposed, who also have similar background stories in terms of how they journeyed down this path and and triumphs and tribulations and challenges. You know that that's what it but that's what really matters. I honestly think is is we all need to take take our own perspectives, blend them all together and truly understand, okay, there's no right or wrong way to enjoy a wine and shouldn't matter on color at the end of the day. I mean, <laughs> wine, wine is very, uh, very unbiased. I feel like the whole concept of wine is very unbiased. And when you see the plethora of colors that should mirror and reflect upon how humanity is. So that's why, why can't we treat other people who are interested in wine like that? If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, I, I think also you going through um, just your SOM education journey, um, mm -hmm. did you feel like there were times where you had to, I mean, conform to a certain standard? You know, that, um, like you said, you were the only, you could, and a lot of the time, you were the only person that looked like you in those rooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can tell you that during the exams I took, I was, I, I could count in a room of like, 200 people I was the only black woman there there was only one Hispanic person there and there was only one other black person there and that was it and we I couldn't it, it was actually um I was actually discouraged to lock my hair years ago because that was seen that was seen as like too liberal uh, or just not professional enough so when I was younger I had curly hair like Miss Nadia over here uh, and, you know, and I said to myself, you know, that that's a phase in my life that I'm ready to transition from into who I truly am, like what personifies me and how I can express myself, not only visually, but also through wine. And that will also help build and create exemplary, unique experiences for people when they see someone that looks like me. You know, I, I wear very very vibrant colors. I love wearing eclectic prints. And that's something that typically is not seen in the wine industry, the traditional wine industry. You're typically wearing suits uh, if you're a Psalm. And though I love donning suits, especially the bright, brightly colored ones, I do miss that aspect. Cobalt blue on blue with blue flats. You know, I knew that wasn't all about me. That wasn't a hundred percent me. And that was something that, that I noticed that part of the wine world was not at all for me. I wanted to be in an area in a playground where it was way more diverse, especially that, especially since it reflects how the world is. The world is, is diverse. Why can't we have genetic makeup that reflects that within the natural wine world or just the wine world in general? It shouldn't just be the natural wine world, but it should just be the wine world in general. Why can't we have that? So I know I know it's it's gone a long way since you know the dawn of time with wine. Uh, however, I feel like we have a lot a lot more work to do. But it's great that 
that we have people, you know, like ourselves and others who support what we're doing that are there that can actually see that we want to break the rules. We want to make it better. We want to make it more welcoming for everybody. It doesn't matter on what you look like. It's happening. It's an exciting time. It is, Linda. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah, you know, it, it is it is exciting. Um, and as we've talked about before, I think amongst, you know, one on one and in group conversations, Maria, is that, you know, wine is an artistic expression, but mm -hmm. so is how we wear our hair, how we decide to represent ourselves, how we just you know, go about in this world. So wine can be looked at the same way. So why should there, why should we exclude, you know, certain groups of people from expressing themselves or, um, you know, wine um, pairing with those people and activities mm -hmm. and enhancing food, like Akari was saying, I think it, it, it really touches on so many aspects of life. Absolutely. Yeah. Our, yeah, wine is is truly like like you said, and I know you and I have had like several conversations about this. Like you mentioned, wine truly is an artistic expression. It's a way of self expressing yourself. And if if people don't understand that, especially within natural wine, and you're missing out, you're totally missing out. You get a glimpse as to who that person is who produces that wine. You get a glimpse in terms of the tasting notes, the the patience, the love and passion that goes into every aspect of producing a bottle of, of wine. Like take, for instance, Akari's wine and Tara's wine. Like they're gorgeously made. They're so uniquely gorgeously made. And when I compare like another skin contact Gewurztraminer to Akari's, like you can't really compare them because they're so distinct. They're very distinct in, in their own ways and they're both very good. Where, whereas like, you know, with Tara and I talked to her about her Syrahs and I love her Syrahs uh, and just how, how earthy, how earth driven they are, but they also have like their own, like their own personality within them. And, and I've really, really respect people who are able to capture a part of their essence within the wine that they're producing and selling. Cause that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of passion. It takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to do literally. Right. Right. And Marlon has joined us from Amplify Wines. Hi, Marlon. I have your rosé chilling actually right now. <laughs> So, uh, Tara, um, your take on this question. I know we've, and it can, you can you know, piggyback, <laughs> hold into anything yeah. that Maria has said. Um, and I know, yeah, yeah, I think it's a beautiful yeah. conversation to have. Maria said, and, and Akari just said it perfectly. Um, but yes, we, we are in a male dominated industry, male dominated white industry. Uh, and coming from both um, aspects of it, both conventional winemaking and natural winemaking, I just feel like there's um, there's more freedom in the sense of uh, on the natural side of it. Um, and for for me personally, um, you know, I, I <laughs> and this is what I've been doing is just really just doing you know making the wine, um, not really trying to conform or pay attention to any of that stuff. I'm just like trying to do my thing and, and making wine and just, you know, being, being out there to, uh, to showcase that. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a part of, of us just defining, you know, the, the wines that we make and the message that's in the bottle. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate the, those, the, those takes on it. I think that, um, it'll continue to evolve, um, through different channels, right? I'm not on the production side. Mari is growing into the production side, but there's also media. There are different ways to tap into, um, really the community and the audience and to grow, right. um, passion for wine in whatever sector that it comes in. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I love that about natural wine, really, that it's inclusive that way. And I uh, really try to, you know, tell new newcomers to natural wine or newcomers to wine in general, if they're not sure which direction to go into, I really encourage people to think about uh, the people behind the wines, not just, okay, does right. it taste great? 
but the people, the culture, the stories. Um, and I think yeah. that folds into why we're all here today. Right. Not, not exactly. And, um, you know, sometimes you just have to forge your own path in, in this winemaking industry. And for me, like, that's, that's what I've been doing. Cause yeah, I mean, it is a struggle out there, but, um, you know, hopefully everything else will, will follow and, um, and people will understand, you know, why you do what you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. And so the, my next question folds into, you know, a little bit of uh, the previous question, um, but might be a little bit more targeted. Uh, what challenges have you faced as a woman of color in this industry? And that could mean, you know, we could touch on kind of the earlier stages in your career, the current stages, um, conventional wine, natural wine, but, um, and then kind of where that's led, where that has, you know, resulted, how has it led into the result of you as a woman today? Um, we can start with uh, Akari. Um, yeah, I guess I would say, so I started with the court and did the WSAT. Um, I wasn't as interested in learning about service, so I switched after doing the level one for the court to um, the WSAT and uh, throughout that time, I was working at like restaurants and wine shops. And I think until recently, I was mostly surrounded by like white people. Um, but I think, I don't think I've personally felt super, um, well, I don't know, I guess. I think I started out as a young manager, so that also kind of played into, um, I guess, the hardships initially. Um, but working through like certifications always helps just to be like, hey, I have the thing that says that I know things, um, whether it's on your resume or whatever position that you're working in. Um, But I think like the longer that I worked in the industry, I chose to be in places where I would be surrounded by people that wouldn't treat me that way. Um, and I feel, yeah, I guess, <laughs> I, I don't really know how to put it into words. <laughs> I'm really bad at this. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, I mean, what I'm hearing is that, you know, as you gained more experience um, and, and years in the industry, you're able to kind of create that community for yourself, too. Um, right. Like in almost any industry, um, and I just, you know, my background's in social work and healthcare. I think about when you're new to an industry, you kind of have to, like, you know, prove, prove your worth. You kind of have to grab at whatever you can to, um, you know, uh, learn to uh, get that experience to kind of prove yourself in a way. Right. But as you work through that, it's like, hey, you know, you are years in the game now. You can kind of create that almost cushion of folks around you. Like, hey, why am I going to take that job when I know I'm not going to like the people that I work with? Mm -hmm. um, it's like, so a lot of us spend most of our day, you know, more time working than sometimes at home with our families. So it's like, let's create that work family or work community um, of people that you really enjoy being around, you can learn from, you can grow with. Um, and I guess that's the, I guess, the privilege of, um, you know, you putting years in and now you're here at that point where you can build that community around yourself. Mm -hmm. Tara. What uh, challenges have you faced? And I have listened to you know podcasts and read all about you. So I'm just it's just a joy to be chatting with you here today. You have years and years of experience. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, it has been tough for me. I mean, like um, I I kind of really stand out <laughs> as well. And um, just for me, um, you know, taking it back to Kita when I was trying to get that project started. Um, yeah, it was, it was tough because of, 
um, my association to my tribe um, of being um, Shumash descent and um, people automatically associate that to the casino. And so um, it was tough trying to go out in the marketplace and, and sell the wine um, because there's just some animosity towards our tribe. Um, and so the, really like the message I was just trying to get across is just taste the wines um, because it's, it's what's in the bottle that, that really counts. Um, but um, there were a lot of times I wasn't given that opportunity. Um, and so that's why I go back when I say that, you know, sometimes you just have to forge your own path um, through this industry. Um, and um, for those communities that, you know, that follow you, that's your support. Um, that's your support group. And so, um, and, and you form these relationships um, with people along the way, but, but yeah, it is, um, it is challenging. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes I, I just feel like I'm alone in this industry. And so it's so great to see, um, you know, meeting all of you and, um, you know, on this panel and, um, and the relationships that I've formed, um, you know, along the way and, in, and, in, in being in this industry, um, that, that has really helped a lot. And so, so I'm grateful for that. Um, but yeah, it's not the easiest. <laughs> yeah, and I think all of us here, and I mean, what Wine Fair really stands for is that, you know, we're here for everyone here. We're, we're rooting for you. We appreciate, we see you, um, all those challenges that you've gone through, even if they're not publicly shared, uh, we have this community um, here and that's, mm -hmm a lot of the reason why I leaned into natural wine. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. these people really are something. Um, right. And there's yeah. support to be showed. I mean, it's just obvious to see. Mm -hmm. But I guess the important part of it is that, um, you know, you, you are faced with all these challenges. And so, you know, it's a matter of overcoming these challenges. Um, and overcoming these challenges just makes, just makes you a stronger person um, in general. And so, um, you know, so you're able to deal with it a little bit more, I guess, like over all these years um, I have, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't let it stop me. I, I, um, I just try and do the best that I can in, in making, in making wine and, and sharing it with, with those that, um, that are really supportive of that and, and, and love the wines um, because in the end that's, um, that's that's the story is is um you know what's what's in the bottle yes yes and well we have Simon on if you're able to hear us i know we're having trouble with the technology um we can uh, kick this question to Simon. um this is we're asking about uh, the challenges challenges you faced as a woman of color in this industry I see that she was able to join into the panel. I'm not sure if she has her audio hooked up. We can kick it to Maria for now. Um, Simon, you can jump in whenever you're able to when you get your audio going. We're happy to have you. Okay, I think you're unmuted, Maria. Go for it. Everyone still hear me? I can hear you now. Yes, I didn't hear you prior. Can everyone still hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. My, like, okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, so I know I kind of answered that question a little bit earlier with with a response I had from a previous question you asked us. Uh, I would say, you know, just extending to what I mentioned earlier, it's, I, I agree with, with Tara, you have to pave your own way. I've had so many, so many obstacles, like even researching how, how to 
get into the wine industry and then figuring out all of it on my own to, you know, finding allies along the way, supporters who truly saw the bigger picture and became mentors uh, along the way for me to um, be like literally having like people ghost me um, <laughs> after asking questions, just simple questions like, oh, how, how do you start a retail wine shop? I know I have experience with it, but from a logistical standpoint, how do you do it? And and you're asking other women. I was asking other women earlier on about this. And originally they were welcome to it. And then they were asking more details. And then that's when they were basically like, oh, we're, we can't help you anymore. You're going to have to figure it out because you're going to be deemed competition at this point. And I didn't even get to the point of sharing with them, okay, where the brick and mortar would be located. It was just they saw that as, I don't know, a potential threat which was very disappointing because I feel like there's plenty of space for all of us to be in this arena and create our own avenues, create our own lanes and maybe blurry those lanes a little bit, you know, along the way as well. And, and I think with me relocating helped tremendously because the area I was in was just not very supportive, like especially, especially involving someone that looked like me. Um, and that that was very disappointing because you saw that there were people around you that wanted something different, wanted a different perspective on natural wines and knowing there was going to be someone young doing something like that, who had some experience already and was very driven enough to get it all done. It was just a matter of, okay, I need to be around people who are more, more resembling of my tribe, more resembling of like my like-mindedness and and if that meant I had to travel across the country to do it, then so be it. And it, it's been like a win-win situation for me because it's not only the retail side that I'm involved in, it's also the production side. It's also the viticulture aspect. So being in, in wine country, you know, that, that definitely was a huge sacrifice for me. Uh, just figuring out what I needed to do to make COVID, getting it all done, and then second guessing myself because I had people who were very discouraging even before I came out here who said, well, you know, like there's so many other wine shops, there's so many producers out there. I'm like, yeah, but there's no producer out there like me. There's no person in the US or in the world that's gonna be like me, okay? That's gonna be able to show and express a different, a different side or scope of what natural wine could emulate or be perceived as. So I think it's just honestly a matter of like finding your tribe, finding your support, and like Tara mentioned, creating your own lane, not being afraid of it. Of course, fear is all part of this game of entrepreneurship and really creating something new that has never been seen before. That's part of the process. And I'll fully admit, I think it would be foolish of me to say I have not had any fear whatsoever with doing any of this. If I didn't, then there clearly be something wrong, I would say. I wasn't feeling something. So I, I would say it's definitely a matter of taking that chance, not being afraid of, of what could come out of it. And it could be spectacular. It could blow people's minds. And it could definitely just generate something that's, that's significantly bigger than all of us at the end of the day. And that's the whole goal. Yeah, there were a lot of things, uh, Maria, that you said there, um, especially the part about mentorship. Um, and I see some comments going up in the chat um, that actually connects to our next panel. Um, but when we talk about mentorship and um, representation within the industry, um, hi, Simon, I want to kick it to you, actually, if you're able to, if you, if you got on your audio. Um, I'd love to hear about, you know, what the roles that mentorship and representation have played or lack thereof have played in your journeys in natural wine. I think we lost Simone again. Um, she'll come back. She'll come back. <laughs> yes, we're going to hear from her. Yes. I have, I have. Um, but yeah, to, to those points, um, Akari has mentored, I, we'll start with you, Akari, has like mentorship or um, I know you talked about um, 
working with somebody that was Japanese in um, in uh, the hospitality industry. But like, how has mentorship or lack thereof, um, or representation or lack thereof, really played a role in your journey in natural wine or wine in general? Yeah, I think um, so. I went to Baton Rouge a couple years ago as a like scholar recipient and. Um, it was like a BIPOC scholarship. So, you know, we had our table of basically all the people of color and then everybody else. Um, and it made me think about how, like I know there are a couple Japanese wine producers or like small handful of just Asian, even in general um, wine producers in California, but um specifically not like working naturally it's you know it just gets like smaller and smaller and um I, I i don't i don't remember who i was listening to but i thought about how um it would be cool for me to be a part of that um like small group of people just and i think like a lot of my friends um, that I grew up with, you know, they don't work in this industry at all, so they have no idea um, how it works, but they're always like, oh, it's really cool that you are making your own wine. Um, and I guess um, in terms of service, I have had a lot of like mentors that have either been helpful with like learning or, you know, um, education in terms of service, but uh, not as much in production. Um, so I think that's also interesting too, to see like within the wine scope, like the different elements and like the access of information that there has been. Yeah, like Mario was saying, um, access to information or access to people that are just willing to dive in and help. Um, mm -hmm. And that's different in different facets of the wine industry because we can't just put a blanket on oh it's natural wine but there's just so many different verticals that come out of there um i think everyone here and you know those those tuning into the panel too um can speak to all those different facets of it um so it's like outside of the larger wine community that we've built it's like oh there's many communities of people working in production or retail or service um or other points um Simon, are you able, are you on the audio? Do we have you? <laughs> You're still on mute, but I know it's a little tricky, tricky to come off mute on the system. I think she's still muted. Feel free to hop in whenever you get unmuted and just kind of hop into the conversation. But Tara, um, as we kind of continue the conversation, you've been in, you know, you, you said you're entering your 25th harvest now. So what does, I mean, you might have a unique perspective on this, um, on this topic as well as kind of what has the role of, you know, representation and mentorship played? I know that you are a mentor yourself, but mm -hmm. um, was that an opportunity for you as being a mentee, um, and not having other folks look like you within this industry. Right, so so for me, when I first entered into the industry and throughout, I really didn't have any mentors at all. <laughs> I had to pretty much learn this all on my own. And so, and so with that being said, I wanted to, to be a mentor for other people. So that way they don't have to go through what I went through trying to get into this industry. Um, and you know, just kind of maneuvering my way through. Um, yeah, it was it was a lot of me just learning it on my own and trial and error, and um, really putting in like double the work that that probably anyone else would normally have to do, um, because I I didn't have anyone I could turn to or um, you know throw stuff off of um, when I first came here to Santa Barbara County. Um, and coming from San Luis Obispo County, because I was there 
there in Paso Robles working. And then I came came back home, which is my hometown, to Santa Barbara County. But um, yeah, I had um, I, I didn't really have a whole lot of um, people that I could turn to to help me with this. Um, so that's why this year I said that, you know, um, you know, with everything starting to change now and everything, I want to be I want to be there helping other people and to be a mentor um, to others. So so I'm part of the um, Speed Rock Advisory Squad um, and then the Legacy Network with the James Beard Foundation um, that I I was one of 10 selected um, to be a mentor for that program that's um, just now starting to get kicked off um, here uh, in the coming weeks. So uh, I'm excited for that. Um, I'm just I'm just, uh, you know, want to be here um, and be a support group for um, not only other women, um, but the BIPOC community in general. And then along with that, too, I mean, um, yeah, I, I want to meet more, <laughs> more Indigenous um, in this in this wine community as well, um, because um, there definitely aren't um, many of us, and um, and uh, I, I would like to um, I would like to to be a support group for um, for my indigenous community as well. Thanks, Tara. I am trying to click around to see if there's anything I can do to help Simon. Um, I don't know. I pressed an unmute all button. So I don't know what that did. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Mari, I know we've heard some different experiences and probably in a lot of the things that you've talked about, you've touched on this too, but um, would you say there's any specific maybe mentor mentors that you can um, feel like you can lean on in terms of, I mean, I know that you've worked Harvest um, in California and Vermont um, this past year. But is there anyone that you would uh, maybe recognize as a mentor in your journey? Totally. I would say most recently, Deirdre Heakin of La Garagista. Uh, she has been an abominable force uh, ever since I left Vermont. Um, we've been very close. Uh, I actually was talking to her right before she wished all of us good luck with this panel. She was unable to make it and watch it. <laughs> Uh, but thankfully it's recorded. So she, she's been a plethora of knowledge, like knowing I'm focused on, on, um, really championing for hybrid grapes, especially because of climate change. She's been, she has been like an extraordinary resource, uh, in terms of just sharing knowledge, you know, really coaching me in terms of what I should be doing, who I should be connecting with to, to what kind of literature I should be. Uh, and then the farming aspect as well. So she's been super supportive of the fact that I've been a part of this viticulture apprenticeship with Akari uh, through the 280 Project and Steve Mathiason's um, wine label, Mathiason Wines, just to get more hands-on experience and just getting her, her transparency and also her, her non-sugar-coated feedback, constructive feedback is what I really relish and respect. Another mentor I see is Martha Stuman. So she she was actually the main reason why I went out to California for Harvest in the first place. I, I highly admire the fact that she is a vineron. For those who are not familiar with, with what that term is, that means uh, basically the OG winemaker who is a winemaker and a wine grower or a farmer, grape farmer. And that's what I strive to become along with having the second business bathing grapes uh, as the retail aspect. And she's just been, she's just been very open in terms of like helping me with my business plan months ago to, to sharing with me, you know, how to get investors to how to uh, figure out, you know, business valuation for your, for your businesses. I mean, and then also just, connecting with sources that I could talk to here in California involving specific types of fruit I'm looking for to, to uh, other individuals I can learn from that are, that are within the proximity that I'm in based upon exactly what I want to do. So I would say those two especially, I mean, they're both Vinerons, which is really cool. And they're both on 
opposite sides of the country, uh, which, you know, I see myself long term down the line, like producing wine by coastal. That's one of my long term goals, as both of them know. And, and I know that's that's going to be one tremendous feat once that happens. But, you know, through some logistics, I know I could make that happen. And with with an abundance of support, you know, anything, anything is possible. I agree. I agree. Um, and, you know, I I commend everything that everyone here is doing, you know, from the um, from Tara, who's been in the game a long time to Maria, you're just building um, and very, I think we've talked in length about the ideas that you have for the industry. There's a lot of things that we vibe on and we agree in terms of, I mean, that's really, social media is how we met. So, mm -hmm. you know, social media and a lot of the things that um, we provide for our audiences, um, I think we have a lot of shared experiences, even Akari and Simon, we have a lot of different varied experiences that I would love to continue to share, you know, outside of this panel, you know, I think there's so much to be celebrated. And I see a lot of, you know, combos going on in the chat. There's so much to be celebrated about, you know, taking your identity, like Mariah said, there was no one else like you. So yes, there are other wine shops, there are other wine producers, but there is no one else that can have the footprint that you have. Um, and I, that really stands out to me. I feel like I have to, I'm going to have to run this back and listen to it again, just to take notes. It's hard being the moderator and hearing so many gems and not being able to take notes. So I'm so glad this is recorded. Um, we do have some questions in the chat as we move to our Q and A, um, portion. Um, we have about 30 minutes of Q and A and we have some really fun questions. Um, I will go with the first question, um, from Camille Martinez. Um, so, so appreciative to hear your stories in forging your own path and creating your own lane. Today, would you say the industry is improving in, improving in inclusivity? Um, any advice to first gen farm and wine by farmer and sorry, farm, farmer and winery um, by pop, someone by pop getting started? Does anybody want to take that question? I'll an I'll I'll answer. I was okay. gonna say, or at least I'll like contribute to the answer. I was like, <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I would say definitely some advice I could I could provide is, you know, just dive in and get as much hands-on experience as you possibly can. Uh, don't just read books. Don't just get certifications. That's not going to be enough. Actually, you don't necessarily need certifications, and that's something I feel. A lot of people don't understand that's something actually Nadia and I first talked about like months ago uh, as she she was mentioning to me she was going through the W set and and I mentioned that's great however don't feel like don't feel pressured that that is the only avenue you should take in order to expose yourself and immerse yourself into the wine industry I've actually personally I've learned more from hands-on experience so whether that's connecting with someone and, and figuring out, oh, there's this opportunity to work, work a vineyard uh, for free, you know, and and also just learn how how to spray or learn how to shoot thin uh, a vineyard. So I've, I'll give you an example, like a few days out of the week amongst working, I help out a friend of mine out in Santa Cruz with tending his vineyard and I get up. It's, it's a two hour drive for me where I'm located. I'm located in Santa Rosa at the moment. And it's a two hour drive for me, but I don't care because that's still experience. It, it may not be paid, but I see experience is more valuable than money when it comes to this kind of industry. And if you can, if you can just like find people who are more than willing to like allow you to help them bottle, to disgorge, to, you know, plant some vines even. And I've done all of that ever since I've arrived to California. Like literally the week I arrived, I was already like helping some friends with their their label, bottling and disgorging some paquettes. You know, the end of that week I arrived here, I was doing that. And then the second week I was helping out a few friends in terms of disgorging some traditional method wines to starting the viticultural apprenticeship after talking to Christopher Renfro, the 280 project. And that's how you just expose yourself more. Don't just feel like you need to travel as well across the country. Figure out if there's vineyards near you, wherever you are in the U.S., and connect with those, with those um, 
grape farmers connect with those winemakers and see if they need extra help throughout the year or even prior to harvest or within harvest. So don't feel pressure to just do everything academically. It's better in this industry to either get a combination of it or and or like hands-on experience. Uh, now, I would say in terms of improving inclu in inclusivity, I think it is. We still have a long way to go, but baby steps are better than no steps. That's how I see it. We still... Oh, sorry. I was, oh, I was just going to add one last thing. <laughs> oh, as I say, it's better. It's better for for all of us. I feel like ever since COVID and George Floyd and all all of these events, Black Lives Matter, all of these events occurred all at once. I feel like this that was a time of when people kind of woke up after not being heavily distracted with everything else going on in the world and everything was shut down that was a moment for all of us to really realize universally that we need to do better okay not only in the wine industry but overall and i think that actually reflected more in the wine industry with them figuring out wow there's some ugly things that we definitely need to get rid of and improve upon and we can do it by doing it together and by also welcoming other people into this world that we know could help diversify not only by what they look like but also just their taste their palate differences and uniqueness yeah i agree definitely diversity of thought diversity of experience um is heavily relied upon versus just how someone looks as we were, I know, as we were kind of prepping for this panel and we were chatting and we're like, dang, sometimes I get asked to be on panels just because I am that token person that looks different than everybody else. And I think that was important in bringing this group together that we celebrate just the differences in experience, thought, backgrounds outside of just what we physically look like. Um, so I appreciate that answer. Um, I know we have a couple more questions. There was one question that I'd love for Tara to answer, actually. It's also from Camille Martinez. Um, celebrating your joys, what was the moment you knew you made it in the industry? <laughs> okay, trying to find the mute again. Uh, wow. Wow. Um... Yeah, I've been in the industry for quite a while, and it just feels like over the past couple of years, um, it's it's finally starting to pay off and, and starting to get that recognition. Um, but yeah, it was a long time coming, I feel. Um, but yeah, I would say um, probably, I think my, my greatest achievement is this Psalm Verticals that just recently came out. Um, that was an amazing, that was an amazing story um, on my my whole path um, from beginning with my first label with Calabashock Wine Cellars, um, then diving into Kita Wines and then starting um, my own winery um, with my wife, um, coming to dreams. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I've been I've been in the industry for a while, but um, getting that recognition, um, you know, over the past couple of years has um, has really um, helped a lot. And um, and you know, I just I just love this industry in general. I just love making wine, and um, and so to be celebrated for it is is I'm I'm extremely humbled by it. Yes, yes. Uh, we have another question, which I think I'm going to post to Akari, if you guys don't mind. There's certain questions I'm reading, and I said, hey, this would be great for this individual. So it says, I love hearing from all of you. Have any of you had experiences or successes teaming up with chefs from similar heritage who are using food to explore their cultural identity? Um, I think in the past I have. I had um, um, a few close friends who had a restaurant in LA. Um, but at the time it was it was more like we were just trying to do a fancy dinner, like let's just pick some wines that people will like. And But uh, I think I am more conscious of that uh, at this juncture uh, because I 
kind of like we said before, where it's like, now I have the space to do it. Um, and right now, actually, I'm working at a Japanese restaurant um, and their focus is kind of like upscale Japanese food, uh, which has been really cool to work with because um, like Japanese food is very popular, like, you know, sushi, ramen and things like that. But I think um, being able to try like more, I don't know if it's more traditional or less traditional, but like more uplifted Japanese food. And like, I've been like slowly being able to work with their wine program. And it's been nice to be able to take those things into consideration to build that wine list. That's very cool. Is that restaurant here in the Bay Area? Uh, yeah, it's called Fish and Bird. Fish and Bird. Okay. Okay. I'll have to look that up. Cool. Looking forward to see what comes out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we do have two more questions. We have a little bit more time, but we do have two more questions. Actually, does anybody else want to answer that question, uh, Tara or uh, Maria, about um, chefs and, um, you know, pairing uh, foods uh, with with cultural identity. If not, we have Carol. Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's really cool to to do. I I actually did a, a little bit of something um, that we we did a pairing with some traditional um, just making some some acorn um uh, like a polenta style uh but and, and incorporating both both my culture plus uh, my wife Mireya's culture who's um catalan uh, and so you know we we did a pairing um with with some traditional dishes and um i i think it's fun to do um I don't know. I, I look forward to to future ones uh, as well as when things start to open up a little bit more, um, having these winemaker dinners and and really taking it um, a step deeper into um, some of our traditional dishes. Yeah, I think that's something fun to do. I think it's um, you know being biracial. Um, my mom is Filipino and like traditionally Filipinos don't drink wine. It's just not in the culture. There's beer, there's lots of beer um, and you know, other spirits, but not uh, wine. So as I cook dishes, um, you know, my mom's recipes, my grandmother's recipes and try to figure out what wines go with it. It's almost like carving out this new space because I don't really have a point of reference from my family or family members. So it's just fun to kind of play with, you know, like Akari said, like sometimes you run into pairings that just do not work, but at least, you know, like now, you know, and you can kind of work towards like, okay, what would work with this? Um, so just being attuned to, you know, outside of, you know, educational bodies, but being in tune to like your senses and your palate and figuring out like, I mean, may not be the traditional pairing, but do I like it? I mean, that's a, that's a, another thing to wine. It's just like, what do you like? Um, and just exploring that through through food. I think food is a great outlet to explore that because um, I've noticed a lot of you know wine people love food and food people love wine. And so that that culture and community that's brought together by sharing something like a meal, like a bottle of wine, um, only makes this this space richer. I think. Um, okay, so we have another question. We'll go through the last two questions. Folks, if you have other questions, you can drop them in the chat. Um, we have about 15 more minutes, so we can go a little bit over, but I just want to make sure everyone's questions are uh, dropped into the, I'm sorry, not chat, but the Q&A portion on here. So another question. Uh, if the past is characterized by scarcity mindset regarding not making space for BIWOC, to lead and to share their love of wine, what opportunities do you foresee um, if and when we approach mentorship with abundance? Um, I'm thinking, I know Tara's involved in mentorship at the moment. So I guess maybe we could talk about, um, you know, what opportunities do you see um, in the future as you work with these mentorship programs? Um, do you see the course of this changing representation and mentorship with, uh, you know, uh, by, by, um, by walk um, in natural wine? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. Um, just, just being a support group for, um, for the BIPOC community in general. Um, and, you know, I, I know it's scary, <laughs> you know, stepping into this wine world and, and especially to, you know, have your own business. Um, owning your own winery is, is even scarier. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, mentoring, I, I, um, I see more and more of it, um, you know, coming about in, um, you know, this past year of, of opportunities. And, and I think, um, I mean, I love it. I, I think it's super important. Um, so, so that way, you know, other people don't necessarily have to go through, um, you know, a lot of the hardships that I went through, um, you know, in this industry. And I, yeah, I just think it's super important which is why I, I'm doing it myself and, and I am being a mentor um, for others and, um, you know, just want to be a support group, just, you know, just in general. And I think as we uh, mentorship can, you know, mentorship, I guess she doesn't have to look one way either. As you were talking mm -hmm. to her, I was just thinking just even, I think within this space right here that we've created and we've talked, to one another, um, just being transparent about, hey, this is what I want to do. These are my experiences. And how do we put those together to kind of create a, a culture or community of membership versus just the traditional like assigned or very like one on one? I think we can um, definitely create mm -hmm. a community. I see that just um, as being, you know, a newcomer to natural wine and seeing what I see and um, and maybe it's my social work brain and me, my love of people and relationships and connecting that I see that happening now. I see that happening in Berkeley. I see it happening in Sonoma when I visit on site that there is a community of, um, of mentorship uh, and, and helping one another grow into whatever that dream happens to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I'm just really happy to see to see it increasing and and to see um, you know more mentors um, out there in the community um, because yeah it is it is important and we want to you know uplift those that are coming into the industry um, and to to help navigate it for them as well um, uh, so yes it's it is important. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yes. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Yay! Oh my god! <laughs> it's like honestly, the worst millennial in the bloody world, right here <laughs> in the flesh. Hi, thank you for your patience. Hi, hi. We actually have a great question that was posed in the chat that I'm going to ask you first. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's a great question. So, listening to your journeys popped into my. So, this um, question is from Orsi. Um, Orsi says, "Listening to your journeys has popped a question into my mind. What would you say to the ten-year younger?" 10 year old younger version of yourself and what would your message be to her? Um, and let's frame that within, you know, wine, within um, all the work that you're doing. Um, Saman, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Orsi. I actually really love this question because I remember exactly where I was 10 years ago, even like if we're talking like May, 2010. <laughs> or 2011 um i had been in new zealand for like almost a year at that point um i had started working in like high-end restaurants and bars and i had no idea like anything about wine one of the questions before was about like growing up with wine present i didn't have any of that um i'm from a very conservative catholic south african family so like I kind of joke that my exposure to wine was church wine, but that was like literally it. And my dad would have like a Heineken mowing the lawn in like a super hot Michigan summer. But other than that, like there was no alcohol in my life until like I started drinking. <laughs> and then it was just like the floodgates. But being in New Zealand and being in that kind of atmosphere too, I, I didn't even know that hospitality was an option. Um, I was in school at that time. I was studying physical therapy and I was in New Zealand and just kind of like, I was kind of just like 
aimless, I guess, in a way. I knew that I didn't really want to be in the medical field. Um, but I thought that like hospitality was just something that I was having a lot of fun with and didn't really realize that it was a passion. Um, and a lot of that came from my family being like, this is not like a sustainable career for you, like medical, like medical field or law. Like that's what we were told growing up that those are our options. And it's the typical like immigrant family kind of thing as well. You know, like you have to get grades that are better than, um, like your peers and your classmates, because there are certain things that they're going to expect of you and you need to be able to like beat the stereotypes that surround us. So like in my head, and I'm one of six kids, my brothers and sisters heads, like all of us never even considered, like they still tell me, they're like, what are you doing in wine? And they're like, they're coming around and coming around now that like, I work for a corporation. My dad's just like, oh, okay, see, you should have gotten your degree in business and blah, blah, blah. But um, I digress. Telling like, myself my 18 year old Simone that this is like you're having fun and you're actually enthusiastic and what it took for me to pursue a career in this industry was other people recognizing my passion and I had a couple of really great mentors in the restaurant industry um who they like getting to do degustations and wine pairings was my favorite part of the job and they're like you know, we sit down after work and like we talk about these wines in length. Like, have you ever considered doing a harvest? And I was just like, I don't even know what that means. So it took like other people recognizing that in me for me to really be able to see that this was something sustainable for me and something fulfilling. Like Tara, even like yesterday, Tara and I were hanging out last night, um, just talking about you know, like this is a passion. We feel so grateful to be in part of this industry. And now like, it feels like even within the past year, things have changed drastically. Like there's still obviously a lot of work to be done, but we're all in this room having this conversation. And a year ago, I honestly can't fathom that happening. And it seems crazy because it was just a year ago, like May, a year ago, the world was turned upside down. And now, like, look at where we are and the communities that we've built for ourselves. It's just all so wild. So all in all, I would tell, like, little Simone, don't listen to mom and dad. <laughs> you can work in the wine industry. Just recognize what you're actually passionate about. And don't be, like, don't be afraid to try because that is something, like, I think is... Uh, it inhibits a lot of people is just fear overall and it's normal and it's natural, but taking like that leap is so fulfilling and worth it. Long answer. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, there were so many things that you said, Simone, that I was just thinking about some of the previous like conversation topics that we talked about during this discussion um, and just really like how, you know, we talked about challenges and obstacles faced, but like, that's something that I guess, I don't know if any of us actually touched on it. Like us being like, it, it could be your own family. Like just saying like, there's a certain path that you're supposed to take, right? Both mm -hmm. my from the medical field too. Um, and so it was like, there's a certain path that you're supposed to take and what's considered a real job or a grown up job um, compared to kind of the other end of it. It's like, no, I'm really passionate about this. There is so much to be made and this hospitality touches everybody um but uh, the view of it being like oh that's not a real job or whatever is just very interesting yeah and i noticed like maria said something i have been listening yeah. <laughs> even though i haven't been able to talk i promise i've been listening um what maria had said like just about well everyone really in a way about paving like your own path but community is also massive and um, for Maria not having like that community behind her um, initially, like when asking these questions about having to get started, like sometimes it really do be your own people. Like my, my family, bless them, like it has taken them a while to come around and they're still trying to understand because it's not something in our culture. Um, like you were saying, Nadia, as well, like you drink a lot of beer in the Filipino culture and spirits. In South African culture, like when I went home to South Africa, like my uncle was drinking whiskey and my uncles were drinking beer. Um, I rarely saw the women in my family drink. 
And it was just like me and a couple of my cousins and we'd go out to a club in Durban and then drink tequila, like, because we didn't want our family to see, but wine never. And now like you think about South Africa and South Africa has a massive wine scene, like beyond Stellenbosch and Swartland and like all these other smaller places and producers and millennial winemakers who are really changing the scene in South Africa. So it's interesting that now like the culture is changing and the community is changing and these things are so intertwined. And of course it's hospitality because everybody needs to eat. Like food is just such a cultural connection period. Like sharing a meal last night with Tara and Maria and, and Justin, you know, it's when we talk about hanging out, there's always food involved. So yeah, sorry. I go on rants. Yeah, no, 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 it's all good. I just, we hadn't had a chance to hear from you. So now I'm just like, you said some things that like connected to previous conversation topics. So I'm like, I'm going to jump all over it while we have you. Um, there <laughs> is another question I did want to ask you, and it was a previous question that we had talked about. Um, mm -hmm. it, your journey and everyone's journeys are very unique. And so do you ever feel like there were any, I don't know, implicit or explicit um, like standards that you had to conform to along on, on your journey? past 10 years or even previous to that in terms of like the natural, the wine industry in general? Yeah, like honestly, kind of all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that like, I've actually discussed a lot with my family um, because it's been a part of my life since I was like a kid, just not knowing where I fit in um, as like a woman of color living in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a very white city in a very white state. Um, outside of like the big cities, outside of like Detroit. And I mean, Grand Rapids is a big city, but in the wine industry too, like overseas, it, you know, we talk about racism in a very um, specific light in this country. It's everywhere. And what I experienced it a decent amount in New Zealand as well. Like I'll never forget a farmer from Christchurch was up in Auckland in one of our restaurants and was talking to me about how his sister, they're of Irish descent, and she married an American black man and he couldn't understand why she did that because they don't have anything in common. And you know, it's just like, it felt very strange that he was so comfortable to even say that to me. But it's, it's there's a lot of just like, I didn't say anything in that moment. I was just like, oh, you know, they, they probably have like similar passions. Like I've just, I've always been very quiet in these kind of situations because I've been shocked. Um, and now like I'm a lot more forthright with my voice. Um, I still feel like I need to conform um, in certain situations, but it's more like adaptability. It's kind of like trying to survive. Um which I don't feel as intensely as I used to feel about it. Like I, I used to change a lot of like my personality in high school. Like I would lie about what kind of music I would listen to. Like I was in bands, I was a band geek and I played the flute and I really loved Avenged Sevenfold and someone who looked like me listening to like metal probably don't see that very often. So I just, I really love Taylor Swift and like stuff like that, you know, like it seems small and trivial, um, but you want to fit in and you want to feel like a part of something. Um, and even in like something like high school where I was like, I wanted to fit in so badly that's filtered into the rest of my life in a way. So yeah, being a part of this industry and moving to California and trying to like, make friends in a place like when I first moved to Sonoma, how do you, how do you make friends in like, as a, at the time, um, a 25 year old, like a little bit awkward, not really sure like how to fit in. It's just the same kind of thing. Like you have to learn to adapt. And um, with that question, you do kind of conform in a way just so that like you can fly under the radar almost, but how Maria had said as well. I'm I'm now saying like Maria, like Tara's wife, but it's Maria. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, how it's she's creating a product that is unique and hers, and nobody else can replicate that because it's a part of who she is. 
Um, and it's very much like I will one day have my own brand launch. And even like in the position where I am right now and where I work, I bring something unique to this role and I need to become more comfortable self and expressing myself and knowing that like I was hired to do this position because of who I am and because of what I can bring and just being able to honor that instead of trying to fit into what I think people want to see from me. Yeah, no, it's a, a, as you were talking, actually, the, the chat just took what I was going to say. Um, we talk about code switching. And I think in terms of like how I was just having this conversation with friends and friends that are all in all different professional industries, whether they work for tech or medical field or law. And we're having this conversation that we're just like, wow, we've kind of had to do this our whole lives. Okay. And in different capacities, like through elementary school and middle school. And I was a band geek too. I played the clarinet. So I was yes, girl. right behind you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you like, we weren't, we, we, we live these lives. So then when we translate this to the professional world or like the c culture or climate of today, it's like, wow, it's almost second nature, right? It's like, oh, I'm good at this. It's like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's like this, this, this uh, skill that we've grown up with and that is just very innate to us that some people that when you're little and be like, oh yeah, you're 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 a nice flat girl or you you talk really well or like those kind of comments that it's like, oh my gosh, like you said, people will say things to your face and you're like, wow, did you just say that to my whole face? Like, oh my gosh. They don't see anything wrong with it. And that's something that I found incredibly irritating, like now like thinking back over the past year like people asking us to do interviews and you know like like you mentioned earlier Nadia like are people just asking me to do this because of what I look like or do they actually want like my knowledge um but yeah it's just I I noticed this in Sonoma like I was one of a handful of black people in the area just period and I was lucky up there too, because I had San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley. The central coast where I live now is what's closest to us, Tara, like Santa Barbara. But I mean, between the two, there's like, we're three hours away from San Francisco and two and a half hours away from LA. So people of color are here, we are few and far between. And like the things that people say I think, cool, but then it's like, it's the dumbfoundedness for me. Like, they'll look at me like, oh, is that offensive? Like, somebody said work like a slave to me the other day. And I was just like, oh, no. I'm, can you not say that? And they're like, oh, I'm sorry. It's just like, it's just a phrase. And I was like, <sighs> just, it makes me uncomfortable. Please don't say it. And that was the end. In the past, I would have just like shuddered and moved along. But now it's like this, this group and everything that's again happened over like the past year has really empowered me to speak up in these kind of situations and be like, wow, that was completely inappropriate. Can you not? And being able to like educate people and granted like it ebbs and flows. Sometimes we roll our eyes and ignore it. And sometimes we speak up. Um, but man, it's just, it's nice to be able to participate in something like this with all of you, like badass women who inspire me all the time. And it's been great just like listening to you all and like, <laughs> um, now being able to speak, but yeah, I just appreciate you all so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, you know, there's so many things of that, that I'm like laughing to myself. Cause I, I, I agree. Like it's almost, we, we, I think as women, as women of color, as black people, we walk around and there's some things that you're like, oh, I don't even have the energy to fight what you just said because I can't believe you just said it. Like there's so many things, like it's not even this one-on-one -on -one thing. There's so many things wrong with what just happened here that this was okay. Um, and I do the same thing. I think I, I'm guilty of just like, oh my gosh, I'm just not going to 
deal with this. But there, there is power in speaking up, even if it is in these one-on-one -on -one interactions, if it is in, you know, an email chain or whatever the case is. Um, and I don't believe it's about canceling people or putting people on blast, but sometimes it's about like, hey, like maybe you really, maybe the, the world is just that messed up that you really don't know that it's not okay to speak like that. Um, and I like to give some people the benefit of the doubt. Some people don't deserve it, but I think there's room for growth and education in a lot of these opportunities. Um, so for all of you here, I'm so happy all of you joined this this uh, panel. It, when Pamela approached me and was like, hey, um, free reign, you get to put this together, invite whoever you want. And I'm like, oh, it was like kid in the candy shop, but also not at the same time. Like, I'm like, I don't, I, I want to make sure I highlighted, you know, the different um, variety of, you know, of lack of word, lack of better word color that we are bringing to this table. And I love it. And um, thank you so much for participating today. Um, I don't, I think we're, we're kind of close on time. I don't know if anybody has any other questions, um, comments in the chat. I hope everyone can see the chat. Um, a lot of fun conversation happening in the chat too. Um, Simone, it was so great to be able to hear your voice. I'm so yeah. glad it's like, it's almost like perfect. <laughs> Big time. Um, well, I enjoyed listening to everybody's stories. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that um, Jeanette actually helped me get this working. So thank you, Jeanette. You thank are you, a hero. Jeanette. Um, and yeah, I'm glad that I could participate because I was looking forward to this and I was super bummed that <laughs> I couldn't get it to work. But yeah. I'm, I'm really glad to be a part of this and I hope we can do this more often and, and in person too. Yes, yes. I was just saying I'd love to meet you all in person. I mean, some of you have met in person, but everybody in person um, and just, yeah, keep the conversation going and like our, there's power in our stories. There's power in, um, you know, confronting people saying weird things like, hey, you can't say that um, and just really like living out our dreams and um, I congratulate you all. Thank you so much for having us. I also want to thank our sponsor. Thank you to our sponsor, Owen Coulter Selections. Um, the next panel at three o'clock kind of folds into a lot of the, some of the topics that we touched on today uh, in this panel. Um, at 3 p.m., the next panel is Patriarchy and Power in Natural Wine. So tune in, and I think later this evening, we're having our winemakers tasting with other winemakers, which several of my friends are on there, and I cannot wait for that. Um, this weekend has been so inspiring. Um, can't wait for the recording, Pamela. So let us all know when that's available. Thank you, Tara, Akari, Maria, and Simone. I appreciate you all. And we'll Thank join you. in the future soon in person. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Nadia, please. for inviting the invitation. This is wonderful. Like de definitely having a stimulating conversation with everybody. These are all phenomenal women. As there's no words to describe like how inspirational each and every one of you are and we're stronger together instead of you know separate so love it yeah. agreed <laughs> and Nadia great moderator we appreciate mm -hmm. you and oh, love you yes. and thank yes. you for choosing all of us yeah yes, yes. yes. thank you you all here I wasn't even all sweaty and nervous I was like you know what <laughs> we're gonna do like this is going to flow. <laughs> Let it flow. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you. Cheers. Have a great afternoon. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your Sunday. And see you guys at 3 o'clock. Sounds good. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.